So my presentation is about uh, the role of the global climate change in structural transformation processes in sub-Saharan Africa based on the case study of Senegal. So this is exactly kind of re uh, related to the previous talks by Yogita and uh, Nancy. I hope you find my presentation interesting. Um, so the this is the slide with the main takeaways. My colleagues recommended me to start with that one, given the time constraints. So let me briefly guide you through this slide. So the problem uh, is that uh, Sub-Saharan Africa uh, does not follow the standard uh, structural transformation pattern. And in, in particular, so the, as uh, previously noted by uh, Nancy, so there is a rural urban migration, but the, in the, uh, there is no uh, industrialization in these countries. And uh, in the context of forthcoming uh, global climate change impact, so uh, the question is, uh, what will be the uh, interaction between the global climate change and how uh, and the structural transformation processes that are already going in sub-Saharan Africa. And the methods that we use is basically the combination of biophysical and the economic simulation models. And the key results are actually in line with the pre uh, findings of the previous speakers. So uh, basically <clears throat> the global climate change uh, will affect uh, Senegal's economic uh, structure and increase existing regional imbalances. And the most developed and the least affected capital, Dakar, so it will attract the uh, former agricultural labor force from all the provinces. Now, although we find that uh, Dakarization, so this Dakarization term is used as a kind of a synonym, but a very specific synonym for urbanization, because we observe that other uh, uh, cities and towns in the country will not uh, prosper. So although Dakarization allows alleviating the, some of the negative consequences of the global climate change uh, for the former agricultural labor force, uh, the non-controlled uh, rural urban migration might have long-term repercussions. And uh, here we uh, consider the argument of premature deindustrialization by Danny Rodrik, uh, who notes that uh, at the level of development of sub-Saharan African countries, um, the services partaking, so our services partaking in the absorption of the formal agricultural labor force might have uh, a long-term negative repercussions for growth. And uh, therefore, as a policy recommendation, uh, we think that uh, Governments in these countries uh, should already consider some of the measures uh, how to canalize uh, this flow of uh, low-skilled workers. Uh, so they need to uh, canalize them away from services towards industrial sectors. Um, and uh, let me quickly guide you through the modeling framework. So as a main data, we use the social accounting matrix uh, and our social accounting, it's important to note that our social accounting matrix uh, actually uh, is regionalized. So here we have, uh, so that allows us to reflect the, uh, to, to take into account the existing uh, regional uh, imbalances. So as we can see, uh, the capital Dakar uh, is actually the most developed in the country. Uh, it has uh, the lowest share of primary agriculture sectors, and it has uh, the most developed manufacturing sector in the country. So uh, the key message here is that the country, uh, although small, it's not uh, heterogeneous, uh, it's not homogeneously developed. Uh, this social accounting matrix, uh, yeah, that that was our main data input. Now, uh, as a source of, of the 
global climate change uh, shock scenarios, we used the uh, biophysical model uh, uh, developed by our colleagues at the International Food Research Policy Institute. And this model provi uh, provides us the scenarios depending on the severity of the climate change for each region in the country. So uh, we have decline in agricultural productivity as well as uh, the predicted uh, world market prices. Now, this uh, input from the global model, or uh, this output from the global model is used as an input for the country level uh, computable general equilibrium model. And basically uh, this uh, country level CGE is a centerpiece of our modeling uh, framework. Uh, because it actually allows us to um, carefully consider the economy-wide repercussions. Uh, so on the one side, uh, we have activities, producers uh, uh, regionally decomposed. On the other side of the economy, we have households. And in between, we have the flows of uh, the factors, products. Excuse me? Uh, sh okay, should I go on? Yes, please. Uh, yep, and uh, in between, we also uh, captured the uh, uh, country's interactions with the rest of the world. Uh, yep, and here is just another key takeaways. So we find uh, for the most severe global climate change scenario, we find that the country will lose only 2% of its GDP by 2050. Uh, so the overall impact is expected to be moderate. At the same time, uh, this uh, global climate change uh, is expected to affect the country's structural transformation and increase existing regional imbalances. So basically, the most already the most developed and the least affected uh, capital will be uh, attractive destination for. Uh, the la labor force which will be pulled out of uh, agriculture by the global climate change. Now, although um, this pattern allows to alleviate some of the uh, income losses for the de nice labor force, the non-controlled policy, according to Daniel Roderick and Margaret Macmillan and many others, uh, this will have, uh, will cause a long-term repercussions for the country's growth, mainly um, because services uh, under this scenario will also uh, absorb part of that former agricultural labor force. And in particular, uh, what we find is that uh, which uh, it will be uh, subsectors of trade uh, and transportation, notably. So these two subsectors uh, uh, notoriously known for the informality, will absorb some of the uh, former agricultural labor force. And therefore, uh, some measures that can already canalize that uh, labor force towards industrial sectors should be considered. Uh, I guess I was relatively okay in time, so I'm ready for your questions. Does anyone want to ask a question? If not, Akash, you have a few more minutes if you want to. Oh, Nancy, please go ahead. Um, uh, thank you for your presentation. And I find this a, a very interesting. I I have to say that I I see this in kind of a regional context um, because the climate change impact goes even stronger the farther east you move from Senegal. I was wondering if you have any uh, information about not just within Senegal migration, but uh, migration, migratory pressures from outside the country. Uh, no, I don't, I don't have... Um these uh, scenarios, but uh, I, I get your point. So if we look here, uh, the 
climate classification. So we already see that uh, although this is a small country, but it's not uh, that homogeneous. So uh, that's an interesting question, actually, because Senegal is also, uh, which we might consider in the next papers, uh, because Senegal is also uh, well known for the uh, transitory or intermediate uh, destination for the neighboring countries. Uh, so if we look here, like this uh, desert uh, Sahelian zone, so probably, uh, and by the way, so what, what we have is uh, the, according to our scenarios, uh, the most uh, severe, so the relative reduction in terms of uh, productivity decline will be in the central provinces, where there is already low uh, productivity in the north and south will not be that much affected. So that's an interesting point. And uh, yeah, we might consider the international dimension in our next papers. Could I also ask, if you don't mind, the, um, is is there any movement toward um, uh, techno sort of climate change motivated technical innovation in agriculture or any information about adoption rates of new technology that are sensitive to climate change issues? Yeah, so in, uh, we uh, in our paper we didn't uh, consider these adoption. Uh, measures, uh, but that, that, that's another uh, sort of possible dimensions uh, that can be investigated because so in our setup, uh, we assume that uh, because of the uh, negative uh, productivity shocks, uh, farmers will uh, adapt by just deagrarizing, so just by just by leaving agriculture uh, because uh, other uh, jobs or can offer just sim can simply offer higher wages. Uh, yeah, we didn't consider other measures, but I mean, that's uh, I am not agricultural uh, agronomist or agricultural economist, and basically that I have seen some papers that uh, investigate, for example, the. Uh, crop changes and so on. So these land transformation models, um, they are not, unfortunately, they are not uh, my specialization. Are there any other questions? If we have a, a, a minute, I just might add this comment that among the sort of elite or rent controlling groups in Senegal are some of the um, some of the religious based brotherhoods. Um, they have a certain standing and they are nervous about importing any kind of religious extremism from neighboring countries. So there are a lot of climate change issues, but they're complicated by many other issues as well. So we're worth looking into. I look forward to it. <laughs> uh, may, if there are no other questions, I will also, uh, so I, I, ha I have 30 seconds left. You, but have, I, you have a bit more that I think they're going to keep it open a couple of minutes, not longer. Okay, so uh, I want to ask, uh, I didn't have time to ask you, uh, Nancy, question to you. So basically, what do you mean? I didn't quite understand. What do you mean by uh, the rents? For example, when we speak about, when we talk about Senegal. Mm -hmm. Uh, basically, the short version is that it's it's basically the consumption power, and that even I'm uh, not power, but the, the the people are searching for consumers, and even though these countries are poor, the there is still rents from being able to sell that matter to that matter to a lot of people they're worth going after so for example most of the international companies multinationals who come in 
to the French West African countries, they're trying to sell. They're not looking for products to buy, to market abroad. Their main interaction with the informal economy is, can I get people to sell my product in these, in these economies? So one, for example, if you've been to any of them that you will find everywhere, are people out on the street hawking uh, prepaid phone cards. Now those, the supplier of the phone service is a multinational. The people hawking the cards are local informal workers. They would rather have that occupation than to have no job at all. So, but at the same time, the multinational has come to Senegal, for example, looking for buyers. Um, and so a lot of the, the, the concentration of rents comes from, um, from allocation of monopoly import rights. So you know people need fertilizer, you know they need rice. And if you've been given mon monopoly or quasi-monopoly uh, uh, um, access or, or permission to import, um, then that gives you access to a lot of rents, which are basically coming from consumers. It, is that clear? Yes, it is clear. I just somehow thought that you might be talking about some kind of uh, natural uh, resources, rents and corrupted governments or something like that, but no. Okay, so Some of I... these countries have that, but it's not dependent on that. And what's also another source of rents from buyers is from the government. If you get access to government contracts, and that's not a free and open market, it's not a monopoly. In a number, lots of people have government contracts, but not just anybody. And that again is the buying power of the government and getting access to that to that buying power. So, even if your country is poor, people will fight for those consumers because there is a producer surplus in being able to sell and policy enhances that surplus.